good afternoon. Welcome in. This is the Joe Gaither Show right here on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. I'm Joe Gaither. This is the Joe Gaither Show, as we said. And you're listening all on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Music, on Facebook, Twitter. You can find me anywhere that you get your, your, your podcasts. You can find me at Joe Gaither 6 for all of your needs. And, of course, you can find all of our written work and all of our material right there on BamaCentral.com. We love all of our programs on BamaCentral.com. You can check out our other two programs on the BamaCentral.com broadcasting network. You can check out All Things Bama and Blue Collar Unplugged. We recently had a new episode of All Things Bama with Austin Hannon and Katie Wendham uh, handling that episode for us. So you can check that out on Spotify and right there on BamaCentral.com. So just check them out, All Things Bama. And of course, uh, leave us a like, review, subscribe. Let somebody know about all of our shows right here on BamaCentral.com. All right, we're going to have a fun Wednesday. It is Wednesday right here, uh, middle of June. And what are we going to do? We're going to have, uh, first, we're going to thank Star Sterling Dixon for, for joining us yesterday. If you didn't, if you missed our show, uh, you can check out 2024 four-star linebacker from Mobile Christian School. Sterling Dixon joined us yesterday uh, to talk about his recruitment. He announced that he was shutting down his recruitment, so he is fully on board with the Alabama Crimson Tide. He named a couple of guys uh, that he was going after recruiting and kind of his goals for the, his, his senior year down there at Mobile Christian. We want to thank. Sterling Dixon and his head coach, Ronnie Cottrell, for setting us up with that interview. What else are we going to do the rest of the week? I'm going to be joined in just a few minutes by my friend Will Miller. Will Miller is handling some business, uh, and he's going to jump into the stream in just a few minutes. And we got several topics to jump into for today. So Will Miller is going to join us today at Real WB Miller on the Twitter machine. He works right here at Bama Central as well. He's one of my buddies, so we're going to talk about a lot of topics. Now, tomorrow, I'm planning on being joined by Ronnie. Rodney Orr, Rodney Orr, Mr. Tider Insider. He's covered all things Alabama football and basketball, mostly football, uh, really since uh, the mid-90s. And so he's been covering, covering Alabama for a long, long time. It'll be a pleasure to have Rodney Orr likely join the program tomorrow. So that's going to be the outlook for the rest of the week and the rest of the day. Before we get Will Miller in here, we'll just uh, marinate on some of these topics. I think Will Miller is updating a computer or so, and that's just how it goes sometimes. We always go live at 1 p.m., no matter the circumstances. And we appreciate everybody for jumping in and joining us on Facebook YouTube, Twitter, you can follow us at Joe Gaither 6 or search us up the Joe Gaither Show right here on Bama Central. Alright, let's talk what I, let's, let's get into, I'm going to save some baseball talk for Will, because Will is our, ex, our, our baseball expert. Uh, but I want to start with Texas football. Texas football and, and really something that they have enacted, something that they have implemented that I believe uh, we will see going forward. I see, I, I believe one, I believe it's a problem. It's a problem for Alabama. It's a problem going forward, but it's, a, it's something that I think will be more and more commonplace. All right, so what's going on in Texas football? Texas football uh, have announced the Texas One Fund donors to earn, to earn Longhorn Foundation loyalty points. So what does that mean in Crimson Tide? In Crimson Tide language, if you the 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 headline, if this was Alabama, uh, would say, "Yay, Alabama fund donors to earn Tide Pride Foundation points." Uh, for for donations, and so that's what it, basically these Texas fans are getting are being uh, allowed to earn loyalty points for donating to the NIL collective. So I think it's got a huge problem in college football that's coming up, uh, and that's one of the main topics I want to get into with our friend Will Miller, my man, Real WB Miller. You can follow him on the Twitter machine as I plug in my headphones. <laughs> Will at Real WB Miller. We love it him and, and all his great work. The future governor of the state of Alabama and mm -hmm. always always putting out great content right here on BamaCentral.com. Will Miller, how's your Wednesday going, man? Joe, feeling good. Um, good start to the show. My laptop finally works. It's so good. it's all updated. Everything's good. I'm excited to get into this. Absolutely. Okay, so I've got several topics. You kind of heard the tease. Uh, we're going to start with Texas football and how the, their new kind of policy that they're enacting with their collectives could uh, infect and affect 
college football. And then I want to talk about Colby Shelton. I know it's a, a little bit of older news, but I want to get your opinions on the baseball stuff. Colby Shelton transferring out, how painful that is. The new Alabama baseball assistant that was hired yesterday. We'll get to know him in just a minute, take a snapshot on him. Uh, I want to ask who that third assistant might be. Will Matt Rady keep his job as the hitting coach and be the third assistant? Uh, Alabama softball is raking in on the transfer portal. Two big, 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 big transferees. One yesterday coming in the form of Aaliyah Johnson. The uh, post-Montana Fouts era is getting kicked off with two big-time transfers. Brandon Miller says uh, there's no, it says not LeBron, says not Jordan as his goat. He's got a different goat and several other weird topics. It could be a fun show today. So uh, we appreciate you hanging out with me today. Absolutely. And, and you said it, Joe. There's there's a lot going around. None of it's boring. And that's that's a big plus, I think. So yeah, I, for I June, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and I honestly, I kind of wanted to start out with this Brandon Miller topic because I saw that Do on it. Twitter. I thought I was misreading it. And, you know, you and I, we've both been in press conferences with, with Brandon Miller. I've been able to interview him myself. And he, he's a sharp kid, you know, especially to be his age. He's, what, 20? I'm 20 also. So, I mean, that's he, – and, he, and he's a smart kid. But when he said that the basketball goat was Paul George – I legitimately had to do a double take. I, I was surprised by that. I, I didn't watch the whole video. I don't know what his rationale was. All I know is I can state confidently that the prevailing opinion is nowhere near Paul George as the basketball goat. So it, it is an, that is an interesting talking point with the NBA draft being one day away and Brandon Miller inching into that spot as presumptive number two pick to my Charlotte Hornets. Oh, man, I, I hope so, so much. <laughs> but uh, that that was certainly uh, one of the basketball takes I've ever heard. Yeah, so Brandon goes out today. He's asked. They're doing pre-draft, basically, media. All the top prospects who are up there are doing me media. And he's asked a couple of different things. And, and really, he, he pulls, his, pulls behind the curtain. He says, okay, I grew up liking the uh, LeBron era, Heat 2010 to 2014, the Heat era. And he says, oh, me and my mom kind of went back and forth a little bit because she was always a Boston Celtics fan. Uh, so I can imagine that being a little bit of a fun rivalry in their household at that time. But yeah, he's asked about meeting Michael Jordan and, and, and he's basically asked about who the GOAT is between LeBron and Jordan. And he says, oh, it's not. Uh, let, me, let me just read the quote that I wrote earlier just so because I ripped it right off the, the video uh, so we're not misquoting him he says uh, he says the, I actually don't think LeBron is the GOAT of basketball. I think my GOAT of basketball is Paul George because I always grew up watching him. So it was never just LeBron. Uh, <laughs> Paul George, 14 years in the NBA, going into his 14th year, eight-time NBA All-Star, one-time NBA First Team, no titles. I mean, okay, you see the, the comparison, six foot eight, uh, you know, Brandon Miller, six foot mm -hmm. nine. You see the play style is similar. Come on, Brandon. I always thought you were Kevin Durant, not Paul George. Did did did, uh, did Brandon Miller catch a case of playoff P in the NCAA tournament going up to the Sweet 16? That 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 is a, a question that was practically begging to be asked with this morning's quote, Joe. So kudos for jumping on it. And... It's hard not to say yes. I mean, he was three for eighteen was in his awful. sixteen game. Nowhere near what you expect from your your Naismith Award caliber players. Your guys that are going in the top three of the NBA draft, whether it was second or third, we still don't know officially, obviously. But when you when you have these big moments, which for all intents and purposes is one of the biggest uh, moments in the history of the program, as the number one overall seed in the tournament, chance to go to the Elite Eight and you disappear. He, it was like a game of Super Smash Bros where he fell off the stage, if you've ever played that game. And and it, it wasn't the type of performance that I'm sure he was hoping for. Anybody in the fan community was hoping for 110%. But I, I would say that, yeah, he probably did catch a case of playoff fee because Paul George, unquestionably one of the great, I think, players of the past 15 years, but hasn't had the postseason success. And he's been a part of a lot of high-powered groups in, in the NBA, most notably from his time post the Indiana Pacers, even though to me, I'll always miss seeing him in Indianapolis. That's, you know, where he 
became a household name. A, a lot of these kids today are too young to remember. But, yeah, I mean, playoff P is a real thing, and I think maybe maybe Brandon caught a case there. I agree with you. Well, okay, this just makes me wonder, like, am I really – oh, my gosh, have I suddenly gone old? If, 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 the, incoming, if the incoming draftees are thinking, oh, man – because Paul George did have a time where he was like, he was, you know, those times in Indiana for about two years, he was probably the best player in the league for about two years, like a snapshot. <laughs> but and, and, and he unfortunately had the ankle injury and, and, and moved, moved on uh, to Oklahoma City and then to, uh, to the Clippers. But like, there was a snapshot where he was where he was really dominant. Does does him bringing up Paul George and really, I mean, he didn't even entertain the thought of Michael Jordan. Uh, and I'm not saying that he's, you know, too short sighted, but 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 is that just a, a product of our, of our age, a product of my age at 33, and a product of, of y'all's age at, at 20? That you know, we re, y'all remember uh, LeBron's greatness. Oh, I love that era of the Miami Heat. But goodness gracious, I looked up as I was writing the kind of article for for BamaCentral.com. You can read the quote and kind of see the see see the uh, see the quote and hear the hear the video or watch the video. Um, I'm looking up. I, I typed in NBA top 100 players all time. NBA top 200 players all time. Paul George, not on any list from like Bleacher Report, from The Athletic, from, you know, just different publications who are putting out all their lists uh, throughout time. So it's like, wow, what a choice. Uh, interesting choice. I just wonder if he's trying to kind of, I guess, take some of it off Michael Jordan because of the recent sale of the charlotte hornets and if he i you know i wonder if if that is something that comes in i mean i'm sure it comes to mind because he's probably met with charlotte in some capacity and the sale was discussed extensively which for the record i think was a great move for our franchise you know jordan is the greatest player of all time in my opinion but he is nowhere he is not on the top 100 list of nba executives um in my opinion uh so i think it was time for the franchise to move on but Part of me wonders if he kind of just didn't want to talk too much about people who are even tangentially associated with the Charlotte Hornets because, frankly, we've never had the money for a guy like Paul George. <laughs> when you want to talk about, you know, ha having guys like Kimball Walker at one time, like LaMelo Ball on our roster, you know, there was a time before he had some off-court issues that were very, very nasty that Miles Bridges was, was going to be a, a great player for us. Um, but obviously he's not in the picture anymore either. So, you know, I, I think that maybe he just didn't want to bring up the Hornets as a talking point on some level, considerate of the fact that there's already the buzz around them drafting him, which, again, like I said, you know where I come down on that issue. I absolutely hope that ends up coming to pass. But I just – I find it hard to believe that you could just – ignore Michael Jordan who conventional wisdom dictates is the best ever and and not even not even just mention him well where where, where, where do you think uh, where do you think Brendan Miller is going to fit in at Charlotte you're, you've already noted that you are a, a Charlotte Hornets fan you're looking at their roster point guard Terry Rozier Kelly Oubre Jr. playing the shooting guard you got Gordon Hayward I mean this is off-season talk but Gordon Hayward is shoot, shooting uh you know in the three PJ Washington four and you know, Mark Williams at the five. You, do you see, okay, you, you bring him in, he's automatically playing the three. You have flexibility. You put you, you bump P.J. Washington to the, to the bench or you trade Gordon Hayward. Well, how do you see him fitting in with, uh, with, with, with what's going on in Charlotte? And why do I not see the uh, the ball boy on this depth chart? He, was, he, was he hurt last he's, year? He's hurt. Yeah, uh, that's why. Okay. Yeah, he can't stay healthy. I would I would have to I would have to suggest Brandon would would probably take over that three spot at some at some points in the season. Charlotte has 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 been a weird unit in the past because like I've said lots of moving parts, lots of players you expect are there, they're not there whether because of injury in LaMelo's case or whether because of some some off-court stuff. Uh, but I just think that you want to have him on the floor obviously night 1. And when you're a team that hasn't won a lot, hasn't really been, hasn't been in the playoffs, been in the play-in tournament a couple times, gotten boat raced, you you want to kind of, for lack of a better term, try him out, put him at the three. If he, if it works, it works. Great, you keep going. Especially because Gordon Hayward's an older guy. I don't think he's trade bait at this point in his career. Um, 
he you could put him on waivers, see what you could get. Uh, those types of conversations. I de- I definitely don't see him as part of the long term future for the team, though. Obviously, um, you know he had that really nasty injury when he was with Boston, like the very first day, and then and then to even come back from that, I think was remarkable. But not to make this too much about Gordon Hayward, that would be the spot I would see Brandon Miller going in night one. And when you've got a six nine guy that can move, that can score the basketball like him, there's not many place you wouldn't want to put him on the floor especially when you're just, when you're when you're trying to set a standard and a precedent for you know actually winning more than 35 games in a season you'll take whatever works to get to that point well absolutely i mean because we'll, we'll, that's my word for brandon my, my word for brandon is to go to charlotte and just play for four or five years and be forgotten be, be, you know put up probably fine numbers but be on that edge of the playoff run like Charlotte's always been and, you know, flounder and become nothing. Like, really, when it, his, his outlook or his his options with Charlotte and with Portland are both kind of, you know, fl- franchises that, that are kind of in a, in, in a limbo mode trying to decide what they want to be or if they really want to be competitive or not. Do you see Charlotte really taking the choice with the sale? You already outlined the sale. Michael, Michael Jordan making a ton of money. Do you see Charlotte drafting Brandon Miller and being able to utilize him along with LaMelo Ball to take that step into, uh, we want to compete with the Bostons, with the Phillies, with the, you know, even you think about the Raptors. The Raptors, uh, you know, we have been always – since their one title, still rebuilding, but competitive, highly competitive. Uh, what will it take? Will Brandon Miller and do you think the Charlotte Hornets are a serious enough franchise to move into that? Hey, we want to compete in the Eastern Conference. I think that we've always had some problems with you know our non-playing personnel. Like we <laughs> we haven't had much of an identity with our with our head coaches. We haven't had the guys that have been there for you know a super long time as head coach. You know, when when we were the Bobcats, you had Paul Silas for a little while. But, I mean, our current coach, Steve Clifford, is on his second stint as, as his coach with us, which is not I, – I would wonder how often that's ever been seen. And I'm not saying – I'm not trying to suggest anything like he's not the guy. I think that with the personnel that we have on the court, he can definitely make something out of it. But right now, we're not looking at competing with Boston, competing with – you know, say Philly has another one of those years where they win 50 games. Well, we're not we're not going to be in those positions this season. Your goal this season is to be in the playoffs with with Brandon Miller as as a high level contributor, and I think that is 100 percent achievable. Because to me, Brandon Miller is going to end up in the long term when we come back here or wherever in 10 years. I think Brandon Miller is going to be the best player that's come out of the draft. I don't think Victor's body is going to hold up. Uh, Scoot Henderson, freak athlete, great talent. Nothing to suggest he couldn't have a long career, but I just think Brandon's physical gifts will will put him over the edge in terms of just the best talent to come out of this draft, especially if he can step in for Charlotte and be that cornerstone piece that really we haven't had for a long time. LaMelo can't stay healthy, whispers that he may want out. Who knows? This is not about LaMelo Ball, not to confuse LaVar Ball. This is not another – in the long series of things that we're making all about the Ball Brothers, but I, I think Brandon could absolutely be that guy that comes in and, and, and transforms the trajectory of the Charlotte Hornets team and the players' impact on a team. You also do kind of have to consider when you when you think about who who was the best. I mean, what LeBron did for the city of Cleveland, what he did for Miami in those in those four years was is is a great example. Also, I mean that you said it yourself that was a great era of of basketball to be in and. I hope Brandon Miller can can come close to being on that LeBron James uh, level, but I think he can be the guy that transforms this team and, and this basketball club. That would, sh- I mean, that that that's what would really impress me because Charlotte, my entire life, uh, I mean, you've lived it, but Charlotte, my entire life has been a nothing franchise, nothing. Yeah, you know, who cares? I mean, Portland a couple times have been really competitive, 
but largely still, you know, an also-ran franchise. So I uh, worry about Brandon Miller's future. Obviously, he's pretty much locked into that number two overall spot. We're going to see that tomorrow night uh, on ESPN at 7 o'clock, but be, be sure to tune in to BamaCentral.com. We'll have all kinds of coverage, uh, pre-draft, post-draft coverage. You can find us on BamaCentral.com. I believe Will's going to be a part of that. I'm vol- I'll volunteer to be a part of that. We'll see if the team throws me on that. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. But obviously, my, my real big way, well, two more two more draft topics we'll, 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 to hit, uh, we'll, and we'll change sports. Uh, one, on the, on the Bama front, the real interesting prospect is, where the hell is Noah Clowney getting drafted? I've seen him going as high as 12 and as low as 40. What do you? What, what's your gut feeling about about Noah Clowney? And do you think you think a team's going to take a chance on him right there outside the lottery? I'm I'm seeing him going to the Indiana Pacers. They seem to really like the kid. You look at that interview they posted of him, and I just, I think that there's been a lot of things clicking between those franchises. So I guess it's kind of fitting then that we open this kind of discussing the Indiana Pacers a little bit. Um, that's. Not been a place. They're at where they sixteen, right? <sighs> no, they're at twenty six. Hold on, yeah, keep going. I thought they were in the 20s. Um, but that's where I see him going. Who knows? We've been surprised before when the Spurs picked Josh Primo was a great example. We, we, like I said, you know, anything could happen. I think that several teams could potentially be high on on Noah Clowney, and I mean, he's he's a really good prospect. I think in this draft, slept on prospect in this draft anybody that's a teammate with brandon miller in college may not draw as many headlines as him but but the talent to succeed in the nba for a long time is is there and noah Clowney as well and so i i definitely see him getting drafted in the first round i think he lands with indiana all right, well, Indiana's got a lot of uh, versatility and mobility on, in tomorrow night's uh, draft. They have five selections in the two-round draft. They're drafting at 7, 26, 29, 32, and 55. So they got a lot of, uh, you know, if they want Noah Clowney, they can get him right there in the 20s, even if they got to move up from 26 uh, or, or, or scoop him right there at 26. I think that, uh, you know, shoot, I'm just hoping that these guys develop. It's going it's to be so much, so much fun to see, you know, really – the NBA game start to kind of follow the same formula as what happened to the NFL around the 2000, you know, 2010s when when uh, when Nick Saban's classes started to get into the pros a lot, and you're like, oh shit, there's a Bama guy on, you know, there's a Bama guy on the on the Falcons, there's a Bama guy on on the Bears, there's a Bama guy on the Patriots, all over the place, and you're starting, you you will start to see that as Nate Oates continues his development. I mean. You look at two first round draft picks going going forward, uh, rumors of Trey Jones on the horizon, JQ another year. I mean, he's not gonna get drafted in the first round, but like you you see electric players all, all over the all, all over the Alabama uh, you know, landscape of, of, the, of the program and it's just exciting it's an exciting time. Yeah, six years ago, you know, twenty seventeen, which was the first year I started watching most games in a season for Alabama basketball. I mean, or at least keeping up with the result i mean you're not having anybody in the draft you know you got you got a roster that lost out in the first round of the nit you know and then awful awful experience and well they did it again the year avery got fired but and i don't but kyra got drafted that the year after that so he was at least on the roster at that time that 2016-17 roster didn't have anybody that was getting drafted in in a lottery slot. You fast forward basically half a decade and you've had first round picks. You had Kyra Lewis, Colin Sexton, Josh Primo. You, I would presume two more tomorrow night. I mean, just what a what a great testament to what Nate Oates has done to this program. And I've been high on the guy since he was at Buffalo. I've, I've made no secret of that. But it, and I'm not even gonna lie, Joe, it's real vindication for me because obviously there would have been some doubt from an Alabama fan base with such a prominent school and program hiring a guy from the mid-major ranks to be the head coach, even though he was incredibly successful. And I would say he's probably gotten rid of, of most, if not all of that doubt. Next steps to make it past the Sweet 16, but I do think that will happen in the future. So lots to be excited about with this Alabama program, both in college and at the next level. All right, here's your non-Bama Bama topic on the NBA draft. Did you see Victor Wembanyama's hands with the baseball? Mm-hmm. Well, what you make of just the size? Yeah, for those who didn't see it, if you're on our listening audience, he made the baseball look like um, like maybe you're holding a ping pong ball in your hand. Exactly. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, 
and that it, it kind of in in some ways you could articulate that into further concerns about the guy's size <laughs> and his longevity in the league i i hope i'm wrong i i mean i think that a seven foot five freak athlete running the boards for 10 years and being able to score would be great for basketball not to mention the fact that he's an international sensation. You talk about fan bases from all over the world tuning into basketball here in North America. I think it'd be great for the sport, but I also don't think somebody that size is going to be able to hold up for more than a few years with injuries. And it's it's not it's probably not going to be anything serious at first. You're going to see like a Lamelo Ball esque sprained ankle that you know. And then, but then it's going to eventually pile up, and soon I, he won't be able to stay off the bench, and and it'll just be too much. But again, I hope I'm wrong. I just don't see a lot of longevity from that kid. You're speaking uh, from experience as a fellow seven footer, right? Oh, of course, of course. Did you see my tapes, Joe? I'm I uh I, I couldn't go to the draft because I I had to focus on my my gubernatorial campaign here in about a decade, but you know, it, it was an avenue for me. What do you think about uh, today's uh, ask t- today's news about seven o'clock tonight? You're going to be looking for a basketball edition, Jaron Stevenson. We've kind of hit on the ba- Alabama on the pro end. Alabama needs some forwards help. And Jaron Stevenson is a young guy. He's a rising senior looking to reclassify and maybe join this Alabama roster. Makes his announcement tonight at 7 p.m. Finalists are North Carolina, Alabama, and Virginia. Uh, Jaron Stevenson, how huge would it be? You, you, you lauded NATO, it's already. How huge would it be to fill one of those two remaining scholarship spots with a future five-star prospect? Well, it's big because... You've heard a lot of whispers about how if he goes to Alabama, he will reclassify to 2023. That that makes it an instant impact get if he does commit to Alabama. Whether he does or doesn't reclassify to the other finalists, I guess, is relatively unimportant for Alabama because they're not playing a lot of ACC teams, even though the SEC ACC challenge is a thing now. It's meant to see him once. But I, I think that it's just big to see with this roster you've had a lot of turnover i mean say brandon and noah go in the first round brandon is but say you get two first round draft picks i mean you just lost two first round draft picks off your roster as freshmen that's a big loss you got a lot of talent coming in but to add to it doesn't hurt all right let's put the basketball to bed real quick let's put the basketball to bed and let's uh let's get your expertise on baseball let's go to i want colby shelton's transfer how broken hearted are we like does alabama have any chance of retaining colby shelton's uh, colby shelton's services i know he's probably going after uh, he's probably gonna get a big, big old bag of money and then the other thing is alabama hired anthony papio is that how i'm gonna pronounce that name papio uh, that's Adam, how i'm gonna Maryland. pronounce it no, I'm going to pronounce it. I think Colby's not coming back. No, it's it's really it, it's a tough. I got thing I got a dollar. I got one dollar. I'll put it in the NIL fund. I mean, you can give that a shot, Joe. See how it works out. I I think that it's it's going to be a big loss. The kid hit 25 home runs. Oh you, yeah. You're not you are not going to replace that kind of production at the collegiate level. Not many people are out there hitting 25 plus home runs. The ones that are. Most of them are in the College World Series, and you saw Colby hit two of them in the Super Regional round. You're not replacing that. And the guy hit an even 300. It's the guy that hits for average jam power is worth. He's like an offensive catcher that can throw guys out on the base pass. He's worth his weight in gold. It is a huge loss, and it would take a significant financial investment, immediate financial investment in the baseball program. I feel like to keep him, let's say for argument's sake, because he's still in the portal right now. And I don't see that happening. It's unfortunate. Uh, I know there were some predictions that Alton Davis would leave in the same in the same kind of spot, maybe looking for a, a bag in the NIL process. Ultimately, that didn't happen because last night he announced on social media they're gonna, he's going to run it back. He's going to come back. So Alton, Davis, for if if you're if you're just hearing it, if if by chance you're off Twitter and and you're taking in the Joe Gaither show on on Facebook or or YouTube or some other platform and you're first hearing it, Alton Davis is coming back, which is a huge, Woo-hoo! huge addition. You're, you're hoping maybe he can start some games next year, and I know he's hoping for that as well. Um, but switching gears to Anthony Papio, the new assistant coach 
it, he's got a lot of ties to Maryland too. He's like Rob Vaughn. He was an assistant there for a long time. He's been a full-time assistant for the past two seasons. Uh, he got promoted to be a volunteer assistant the same year that Rob took over as the Maryland head coach, played at Maryland for five years. So obviously the ties to College Park run pretty deep for him. But big opportunity for this Alabama program. I think Rob Vaughn was a home run hire. And now he's bringing a guy that he's got already a strong relationship with. Presumably he's probably known the guy forever because Rob was an assistant you know, at Maryland even before he was hired as a head coach. So you know Rob Vaughn trusts – this guy's stuff and for the third assistant spot i i don't see any i don't see what's not to like about keeping matt rada in his current spot as the hitting coach he he's resonated a lot with alabama's players and the, he has the fan base of support um obviously a vocal leader for the team as you've seen you know when he got thrown out of the game and in the super regional round which you know, but I, I would say that the hitting is largely, you know, uh, at least for this year. I think this year it improved throughout the season. Oh, it did. And you, like I said, you got a guy in Colby Shelton who hit 25 home runs, absolutely blew the freshman home run record out of the water, and he's also batting 300. You know, you got, you got guys hitting in the high 200s. Jim Jarvis had a colossal slump going into the postseason, but he peaked at around 310, which is – absolutely awesome in the leadoff hole when you're counting on your guy to get on base he's one of the best two strike hitters in the country in my opinion so lot agreed lots to like about about the bats at alabama which is all the more reason to to be encouraged by the prospect of keeping that absolutely so that i mean that's that's fun uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the Alabama baseball program will be able to keep, sustain momentum and keep things rolling. All right, let's talk football because, you know, that's the bread and butter. And let's go back to the topic that we introduced right at the top of the show. The Texas football program has basically enacted uh, – all right – the Texas One Fund donors will earn Longhorn Foundation loyalty points now. All right, and how this is going to work is, here it is. All right, the current breakdown for donations awards five loyalty points per $100 for Longhorn Excellence gifts. And another two points are given for $100 donated toward annual seat-related gifts. So, all right, break that into Alabama perspectives. These, 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 boosters these donors these supporters alumni are donating to the a alabama fund of 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 texas of, of out in austin is basically donating to the, the equivalent of the yay alabama fund and they are receiving in turn tide pride tide pride points they're receiving tide pride points and uh you know obviously with that comes better seating better uh you know you know postseason postseason tickets and you know athlete availability to d different access you know, t through those tide pride points I wonder, is this a good thing? And really, really, Will, how, how this sets up is uh, the athletic directors, uh, let's see, okay, Smith, uh, let's see, this fellow, uh, Texas athletic director, Chris Del Conte, yes, basically is talking to, uh, talking to On3 Sports. Uh, it has basically said that the giving slowed down from year one to year two. And so this, uh, this basically, program or this change is going to increase or you know re-stimulate the giving amongst the Texas program. Uh, I think this gets out of hand because this is allowed through Texas state law, uh, the House House Bill 2804 signed into law 10 days ago. Uh, <laughs> revised NIL legislation provides cover for schools for being punished by the NCAA for any NIL activity. It just all goes to show that you need some sort of national real rules on this stuff. Wow, what a mess, Will Miller. Yeah, Joe, I, I agree with what you said at the end. I think that you should have seen this coming without a federal legislation, a more uniform approach to NIL, and now more schools are going to be doing it. Texas is a program that we've talked about here on the show before as just having buttloads of money, and they're always going to have buttloads of money, and everybody around is going to be competing with said buttloads of money. That's how it's been for a long time, even dating back to the early parts of last decade when they brought about the Longhorn Network and, and, and shifted college football as we know it with the ramifications of that even still being felt today with conference realignment and all this. 
you know, like I've said, I've made this point before, today's kids are too young to remember. Texas forced A&M and Missouri's hand as to why they're now in the SEC, or at least a big part of it, as I understand it. Uh, there was there was a, a lot there with the Longhorn Network and what it might have represented at that time. Of course, stuff like that's since been just absolutely put to the side with NIL is so much of a bigger issue. But I think more schools are going to start doing this. And without federal NIL legislation, I would argue it's almost going to ramp up. I mean, who's to say – that this is not going to reach the point where you have, you know, people just openly paying players directly, like think John Ruiz at Miami, people who are just openly giving these swaths of cash to, to young recruits to come and play for a specific program. Without these rules, it's only going to keep happening. I mean, my dad has had season tickets for years. My dad's had season tickets for a little more than a decade. So he, he makes his, his tie pride donation and, and all that stuff. But I couldn't imagine if, if that now played into like maybe going into keeping somebody at school like a Colby Shelton or bringing in new recruits like that just adds a new element to the game that I don't know how good that is for the sport, but that, I guess that'll be for federal legislators to argue about because there ha- like there has to be something put in place. Well, the, the, the problem, Will, is NIL – the problem becomes salary versus NIL, and, and, and you know you're getting uh, you're getting these payments, and you're getting you're getting really these athletes taken care of uh, through the avenue and through the guise of NIL, but it really should be salary. And Coach Saban has talked about, oh, we want to get a salary cap in college football that way everybody's equal. Well, you know, there's no salary cap in the NFL when it when it, when it comes to endorsements. Russell Wilson can do Nike, can do Gatorade, can do uh, McDonald's, can do you know, can get paid as much money as he wants to by these by the by these uh, corporations. The difference is these colleges are having these collectives act like corporations, like McDonald's, like Nike, like like Coca-Cola. And that's not sustainable because, you know, it really just it comes down to how much uh, how much you can raise for these collectives. I'm reading here uh, for, from this report that the high end of these collectives uh, for, an, for, for an 85-man team, for an 85-man roster of football team, you average $8 million. And so it's, it's it's nuts to me. And so you get the, the problem is the schools don't want to pay the players because they don't want to take on that liability. They don't, they don't want to take that take on that financial responsibility because they know that not every single player is worth uh, you know the hundred thousand dollars, the million dollars that they're getting from the from the collective right now. Who's paying it? It's the supporters. The supporters are paying it, not the school. So as long as the supporters are, fill, are footing the bill, that's great. That are just. I don't know. To me, I have a problem with the administration level. I have a problem with the college level. You know, over the course of you know fifty years, over the course of at least thirty years, uh, skirting the responsibility of taking care of the athletes at, at a financial level. Yes, you get the scholarship, and people say, "Oh, that's enough. The scholarship's plenty." You know, Davo Sweeney. I valued my scholarship. All right, great, Davo. That's awesome. Your your academic scholarship looks great, but you also. Create tons and tons and tons of money. Look at the revenue report that Alabama ju- just put out. I know revenue and, and profit are different. I know I get that, but but you're still bringing in two hundred and eighty some million dollars a year on your athletic budget. Like these, and and, and that's not to say what the, the the state of Alabama's economy, the city of Al- uh, Tuscaloosa's economy. And just the campus that is, the University of Alabama, look at the out-of-state tuition over 15 years. Yeah, you've got inflation and the economy at play as well. But a large part of that is Nick Saban and his success rate. And so these schools are thriving. Well, you got to consider, Joe, uh, sorry to cut you off, no, but you please. also have to consider these enrollment numbers. Yes. What, 15-some-odd thousand when Saban got there, and now I'm a student now as part of a 40,000-person a campus. And you exactly. got to think, even when – those people are going out on a Friday night and they're, they're going and, and hanging out with their friends and they're going to these, these restaurants and, and places and, and spending their money and, and how that fuels into the economy. I mean, you got to even talk about the, the, the tangential effects, not even just what's directly being put out by the football players and coaches, but also by people moving into Tuscaloosa. And, and, and coming in as a result of this program. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge economic impact for 
for our state that we live in. It's an impact for if they move out of state and their Alabama degree has them set up with a great job, which hopefully that's the case. That's a huge economic impact for that state. The, where whatever it is so the, the impact is is even larger than what's being seen on a football field or the tickets that are that are being scanned this is you're talking about a huge financial proposition here if these billion dollar media rights deals didn't clue you in you can even look at the 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 everyday levels to, to kind of bring an argument to that and, and so because of that you have to pay the athletes in some sort of fashion. And so NIL becomes their workaround. Hey, we'll just let the the, the donors handle it, and we'll just try to squeeze the donors and squeeze the alumni and squeeze the and out of them who care about if we win or lose. Sure, I think Stuart Bell loves winning a national championship, but I think Stuart Bell win, likes winning a national championship because it brings in money. I don't know that uh, it's overly important to him as far as he goes home at night and kicks the dog if Alabama loses. Uh, it's just the, 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 the bridge that you get, the gap that you got to bridge is between the universities and the NIL. You've got to figure out a way between where you're taking the financial responsibility a little bit off of a little bit off of the donors, a little bit off of the fans in that responsibility because it has to come from the school based on how much benefit that they're gaining. Uh, I, I know Coach wants unification. Coach Saban wants a unification of rules, and you might get that on a national level, but it might be if anything goes. The rule might just be, hey, everything is legal, anything goes, because I, I, there's no way to, you know, you, you, you look, I'm going to give you the Texas, Will Miller, the Texas donor, a bunch of Texas pride points for one year, and now the next year, the federal legislation rules that to be illegal, and so you don't get it, and you're, you're angry about that. Like, you just... <laughs> It, it, it's too much of a mess at this point to try to control. Uh, I, I, I think the best bet is just to take the reins off of everything and say, you know what, uh, do like the state of Tennessee, you, you've got athletes in Tennessee who are signing NIL deals in a high school, uh, which, is, which is nuts. Same thing in California. Uh, it, it, it's crazy how uh, the whole thing is just flipped on its head. Now I do, I am happy that the athletes are getting compensated but it's just nuts how much the whole thing is getting flipped on its head. Well, in Texas, being one of the schools to spearhead any donor-based programs was probably one of the worst-case scenarios. You know, it's it's not like some some tiny school anywhere. It doesn't even matter what state or region of the country they're in. I mean, Texas, like we've said, is, has a ton of money. Well, and I applaud their innovation. I applaud their innovation in that fashion. And then you remember, what, what, two years ago, they had the Pancake Factory. Every offensive lineman is going to get 50K. I, you know, I applaud their innovation. If they can fund it, make it happen. Yeah, and there is something to be said for that. Without the without the federal legislation, are they really doing anything "quote unquote" wrong? No. Who's to say yes? It. But in the absence of of rules, you're going to get these kinds of discussions and these kinds of things happening all over the place. Because yeah, you got to wonder where does the buck stop? Where do you finally rein the situation in? And these are problems that affect people of a much higher pay grade than myself, much smarter than myself. But you have you have to think that there's I think it'll be the next couple of years. You're going to have to reach some sort of some sort of point of understanding, whether it be federal legislation, which you'd have to kind of hope it is or something else that this is what you can and can't do. But there's just not a lot of that right now. Well, I'm about out of topics. Let me throw two. Let me throw one quick one at you, and then I'll see if you got anything for us. Did you see the Daggum Detroit Lions helmets this morning? Ugly, I did. huh? Ugly. Boo. I did. It wasn't that shocking to me. I don't think they needed an alternate helmet. I, you know, they want to sell many. They want to sell Riddell many helmets for money at the team store, which nobody takes issue with. I'm sure the, the kiddos can get those when they're at the games with their mom and their dad, and and they can take them to the meet and greets and get them signed and have a really cool memento. But, you know, I the Lions are not one of those teams that need an alternate helmet. It's like if the Packers were to ever do a wide out or the Bears really don't need that pumpkin lid that they have. I don't hate it, but they don't need it. You know, but it, it's just it's it's a it's a branding and, and marketing thing as much as it is anything else. I thought it was going to be a lot worse, but 
it wouldn't have shocked me if it was a little bit better. Um, I, I had hoped the Lions would would do a wide out, like a, maybe a, bring back that the really imposing logos from the early 2000s and put it on a white helmet and do it with their iced out uniforms. But those those hopes were dashed. Um, that would have been nice. They, they should have hired you, Will. Appreciate that, Joe. I I I do. I do know a few creative media majors that might be able to help me if I ever did find myself in that job. But I think, you know, and it, it doesn't make me feel great because the Broncos are going to have an alternate helmet at some point. I'm thinking probably in the next month because camp's about to get started and they'll they'll finally reveal it. They announced it in April. And I, I was thinking, you know, maybe some sort of I, – I hope it's orange. I'm not even going to lie. Twitter thinks it's going to be white. I hope it's orange. But – it could look like anything at this point with the Lions helmet they just put out today. It really could look like anything. So I just truly don't know what to expect. Yeah, I think the old school Broncos logo on an orange helmet would look pretty nice, honestly. Agreed. And the reason I say that is because they have to wear it with the color rush uniform. So it would it would kind of make sense. I wouldn't mind a white helmet with that, with the, the throwback D logo on it. I just like that logo. I, I love our I love our current mid nineties horse logo it's very intimidating um in in some ways the mascot itself really is not but the logo is nice but it's time for a change i think for us and and we got that we've we've obviously had a lot of changes we had a recent sale as well my my professional sports teams have had a lot of ownership changes lately um and our team president has has alluded to getting new uniforms in the next couple years and i think that whatever new helmet we get is going to be a kind of indicator of what you might see in 2024, 2025. But, hey, as 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 long as it looks okay, I'm cool with it. Will, you got a top ten list for me? Um, Top no? ten of – I could do top ten anything. I could do top ten NFL alternate helmets. Number oh, one. no, I thought I gave you uh, – yeah, go ahead then. If that's what Number you got. one, Falcons Reds. Okay. That's, that's number one for me. Um. Uh, number two, Eagles Kelly Green, just because I'm a I'm a Kelly Green aficionado for the for the Eagles, and I'm really excited to see Jalen Hurts back in back in that get up this this season. And I think that that Joe that jersey man, that jersey might be one of the top sellers in the NFL this season in terms of like an individual jersey color. It wouldn't shock me. Absolutely, be right in there. People can hang it up next to their Randall Cunningham jerseys that look the exact same. <laughs> Maybe so. I mean, oh gosh, that's a throwback. <laughs> uh, right, don't, uh, throw, throw us real quick. Let's wrap it up then with this. Let's wrap it up with life after Montana Fouts. Uh, Alabama okay. brings in Aaliyah Johnson from LSU, a freshman from Fairhope, Alabama. Hit the transfer portal, uh, came to Alabama or, or announced for Alabama yesterday on the Twitter machine. She's a two-time 7A pitcher of the year right here, uh, right here in Alabama. She had 12 appearances last year for LSU, 44 innings pitched, 141 ERA, 31 strikeouts, 27 walks. And obviously, what, two weeks ago, maybe ish, uh, Alabama brings in Kayla Beaver out of Central Arkansas. Life after Montana Falcons. Looking pretty good, around the, looking kind of hopeful. Well, it's pretty clear where the priorities are, obviously, on the pitching. You're not going to replace Montana, like we've said on the program here before, but encouraging start. You'd have to think, you know, I mean, these are two high-level arms. You know, I, I mean, Kayla was early. She came through pretty early. I mean, I think was the season still going on when she? Committed? It was like the day. It was like the day after they were eliminated. It was like literally the day after. So, but that's a huge get, and I, I would, I would still even say kind of flying under the radar. But it's pretty clear what the priorities are, and I think last season made it apparent. You need pitching depth. You didn't have it. Um, and, yes, Jayla Torrance stepped up. We had a lengthy discussion about that. But you don't you don't want to be in a position where you're you're throwing and hoping, you know, to use a to use a fight term there. You don't want to throw and hope when you get to the postseason, when you get to this regionals and super regionals. You don't want to be in a position where you, you hope that a certain position group can deliver. And I think that you're setting up for a position where you can feel better on the front end. And I think you feel great about Jayla Torrance, by the way. I'm not I'm not knocking her whatsoever. I think that she has a great case to be number one going into next season, the first year after Montana Fouts. But 
you know, if you want to have postseason aspirations of any kind, pitching's the key, and and to 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 really storm out of the gates and get pitchers from the portal is a huge sign of encouragement for Alabama softball fans. Well, I think it's going to wrap us up here on uh, today's edition of the Joe Gaither Show. Be watching around 7 p.m. tonight. We're going to watch for Jaron Stevenson's commitment. Our guy Blake Byler is going to be all over that for Alabama and Bama Central right here on BamaCentral.com. Uh, we'll be watching for that. Obviously, we'll be back tomorrow. I plan on having Rodney Orr join me tomorrow, Mr. Tyler Insider, to talk Alabama football recruiting offseason and more. We're going to obviously talk about NBA draft. Goes a little bit deeper into that tomorrow. It's been a fun week so far. We want to thank Will Miller. We want to thank our friend Sterling Dixon who joined us yesterday. Will, anything you want to promote or tell the people? Follow him at Real WB Miller on the Twitter machine. Anything you want to tell the people before you get out of here? Before we say goodbye? Yeah, you said it, Joe. Follow me on Twitter at Real WB Miller. Um, that's no changes there, but I'm hoping to stay pretty active, stay busy, even in the dog days of summer, so not hopefully not having too many content droughts. So just you can keep up with me and even in the off season for the various sports because I know we're kind of at, a, at that weird point where the seasons have just come to an end. But I'm hoping to stay pretty busy, have some stuff in the pipe. So hope, hopefully everybody can stay tuned. And I'm, I'm not expecting to keep anybody waiting. So I'm, I'm excited for the fall, but I'm also excited for the now and, and just kind of hoping to stay in a routine, stay in a rhythm and, and keep the great content rolling out. That's what's up. That's Will Miller, everybody. Thank you so much, Will, for joining us on the program today. And that will do it for a Wednesday edition of the Joe Gaither Show right here on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, on YouTube. You can follow us on Spotify, Apple Music. I got I made sure that we are on Audible. We're on Amazon Podcast. We're on basically any place that you can find your podcast, the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. We are uh, efforting to find our friend Rico Scott, Alabama, uh, Alabama wide receiver commit out of Pennsylvania and we'll hopefully gonna bring you an interview with him in the coming days uh, on that side of things so for Bama Central I'm Joe Gaither I appreciate Chris Walsh for putting me on each and every day you can follow him at Chris at writing Walsh uh, you can follow our other BamaCentral.com broadcasting podcast at all things Bama and blue collar unplugged I appreciate those other shows as well so for uh, for you the listener I'm Joe Gaither this has been another edition of the Joe Gaither show for BamaCentral.com.